All right, thank you very much. And uh, the, the idea is that I'm giving an introduction to ambrosio kirchheim theory and joint work with Wenger to provide uh, sufficient background for Antoine Song's talk today. So that's the idea. I'm sure that I cannot cover everything that's needed for his talk, but I'll do my best to sort of give the basic ideas so that especially um, doctoral students and postdocs can be you know, up to date. So. So the long history starts back in 1960 with Federer Fleming's um, a question. They're asking, how does an area minimizing sequence converge and what does it converge to? And if you look on this left side here, if you look over here, you see sequences. You might have a boundary that's fixed and you might be looking for a sequence of surfaces whose area is decreasing toward the minimum, the infimum of all possible areas of surfaces. And you don't know if the minimum is achieved or not. And you can see how getting smaller and smaller area can even become space filling. So it's unclear how such a sequence would have converged until Federer Fleming came up with a notion in 1960. They called it flat and weak convergence of submanifolds. These are two different notions that agree in many settings of submanifolds. And a more general class of spaces called integral currents. This is a generalization of submanifolds, integral currents in Euclidean space, and they prove the compactness theorem for these sequences. Um, and thus, you would say that this plateau problem has solution in Euclidean space. And then Ambrosio and Kierheim in 2000 defined the notion of what if you're in a metric space now? So now Z would be like a complete metric space, or, and they would ask, um, how could we define integral currents? So they defined a notion of integral currents for the metric space is Z, and they also proved the corresponding compactness theorem now in this more um, general setting. And then in joint work with Stefan Banger in 2011, we defined what was called intrinsic flat convergence, which extends this idea, which originally had been for submanifolds, and the natural extension of a submanifold was called an integral current. We now have extended the notion of a Riemannian manifold, which is not lying in an ambient space. And we have defined integral current spaces. And then Wenger proved the compactness theorem for the sequences of such Riemannian manifolds with integral current space limits. And it's the same sort of compactness theorem as the previous two. All right, so that's the overarching history and how many years passed. So I'm gonna start with the Federer Fleming a little bit. So Federer and Fleming introduced integral currents in Euclidean space to study the convergence of submanifolds. Here's the plateau problem. You have the infimum of the area of say any uh, submanifold whose boundary is something fixed. For example, it might be a circle sitting in Euclidean three space. So this could be the area of a surface whose boundary is a circle. Um, is this infimum achieved? So you would take these sequences of MJs, just like I just had on the previous page, and you're asking in what sense might they converge to what you expect the uh, limits to be, which should be the flat disk. So why would something like this converge to a flat disk? So they had to think about this example in particular, but that in general, their, their uh, results work in any high dimension of Euclidean space and any dimension of submanifold whose boundary is one dimension less. And they actually study even sequences where the boundaries can change. But what they noticed for this particular example and then defined in general, was that you could say that these MJs here are converging weakly as integral currents to M infinity, which is the flat disk. And they made this definition if the integration of a differential form converges to the integration of the differential form over the limit. So you can look at that and you think, oh, if I'm integrating over differential form, define a Euclidean space of the same dimension as M, so a two form in this case, a two form on Euclidean space. So for any differential form, any differential two form in the case of surfaces, K form if it's K dimensional spaces, submanifolds, and you test against forms and you always get this convergence, then you are converging weakly as integral currents and the word integral is coming from integration. All right, so then they want to define more generally what an integral current might be, even when it's not a submanifold. So the key idea, I'm gonna leave that there, is if you do define this notion of convergence, MJ converging weakly as integral currents, M infinity by testing them on differential forms, note that the boundaries will then also converge weakly um, as integral currents because the boundary testing on a differential form is using Stokes theorem. 
the integral over mj of the d of, of the form, that will converge to m infinity of d of the form, and then that's equal to the boundary of m infinity of the form. So this is a crucial uh, property when you have this uh, weak convergence of as integral cards. This will work for any one form. And so Federer and Fleming also prove that if mj converges to m infinity in this weak notion, then the limit of j goes to infinity of the area of mj squaring with the area of m infinity. Now this area is the notion that you would use if they're actually submanifolds, but they have to dry, define more generally if they define m's more generally as integral currents. To handle non-smooth limits, better Fleming defined integral currents. Now the idea is to have this notion of integrating over forms and to have a notion of boundary. So what they do is they find integral currents T which act on forms with boundary defined by boundary acting on a form is equal to the current self acting on the D of the form. And the mass they have to define, which is kind of like a weighted volume, such that TJ converts weakly to T infinity if the limit of J goes to infinity, the mass of the TJ is squared with the mass of T infinity. So these T's are going to be built up by many little pieces of Lipschitz charts and things of the sort, but I'm not gonna give the precise definition today because we're interested in ambrosio kirheim theory. And the problem with the um, original federal Fleming theory is it's very Euclidean space. As you can see, it's already depending on differential forms. So to give precise definitions, I'm going to switch over to ambrosio kirheim So Ambrosio and Kierheim define integral currents on metric spaces. So they consider a complete metric space, Z, D, Z. And we have no differential forms. So we're going to consider these things that are tuples of functions, F pi one to pi M. And F is going from Z to R will be bounded and Lipschitz function. And the pi i's from Z to R will be Lipschitz. So you're on a metric space. We don't have smooth defined anymore. We don't, but we do have Lipschitz defined. So these tuples were first defined by DeGiorgi. And then we can define Lipschitz submanifolds phi from mm to z. They act on tuples in the following way. So you, this is the notation that's used. Phi star of m in this bracket is the, this is going to be our integral current created from the Lipschitz submanifold. It's acting on this tuple instead of a differential form. And the way it acts on it is by integrating over the original manifold back here of f following phi d pi one following phi wedge wedge d pi m following phi. So sometimes people actually write this as f pi one wedge wedge pi m or f d pi one wedge d pi m. That's, but I'd like to prefer to keep a reminder that this is only a tuple. All the um, properties like alternating come from the definition here of what the um, integral current is rather than the forms properties. And then they define D of the tuple. So if this is the tuple, D of this tuple will be one F pi one to pi M, because if you took a differential of this, you would end up with one DF wedge D pi one wedge D pi M. So D is now defined. And once D is defined, you can define boundaries. So now we have the boundary of this submanifold push forward acting on a tuple. It's the same as the push forward of M acting on D of the tuple when you define it this way. So everything's just set up to work perfectly for a Lipschitz submanifold. And notice that even though phi is not differentiable, D pi one following phi is defined almost everywhere. And all of these are defined almost everywhere. And that's fine for making an iteration. So now we have the, so we have the Lipschitz submanifolds and I'm just going to scroll up to generalizing what is generalization of the Lipschitz submanifold. So Ambrosio say a rectifiable current, T is a current acting on tuples, such that there exists Borel sets AI inside the original RM. So this is the, um, think of these as the, the, the domains of charts and Lipschitz phi i's that go from AI to Z. So Z is the ambient space that we're talking about. We're gonna have these images to be disjoint. And weights AI in the reals such that T is equal to a sum over AI's countable sum of AI's of these push forwards for each one of these little guys. So this push forward we already defined up here. All right, so that's all fine. The summing up such a such a thing is, is fine. You can certainly do that if it comes out finite. And this part 
would mean that the integration is over the AI. AI being Borel would be enough to define this integration fine. So all of this works well, but now what we've done is what we've created is something that's built out of many little chart pieces. So I tried to draw little pieces here all over the place. Every little piece could have quite horrible boundaries because they're only Borel, all right? So these are horrible little pieces all added up and each one of them is weighted by a real number. And this, this forces this condition here that the sum of the AIs times the Hausdorff measure of these images being less than infinity, which is a finite mass condition, is enough to guarantee that the sum will converge. Uh, Christina, can you please uh, repeat what uh, is a Lipschitz submanifold? Maybe you defined it, but I kind of. Uh, it's just Lipschitz. Just let phi to be a Lipschitz map from a Riemannian manifold. Ah, uh, that's it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now we're just even extending it. Now it's not even a Romani manifold, it's just a Borel set. So now we have Lipschitz maps from Borel sets. <clears throat> so we're generalizing the idea of a manifold sitting inside a, a um, metric space Z. Now we're summing over and it's quite a horrible thing. All right, so now I'm gonna continue scrolling up if everyone's fine. T is integer rectifiable if the AIs are in Z. So that will just force them to be integers, right? So if the weights are integers, now we have an integer rectifiable current. And in that case, if I just copy from above what this push forward meant here, I'm copying it over just so we have it handy for the future. T acting on F pi one to pi M will now be the sum over AIs. <clears throat> AIs will be integers. Uh, for each one of these um, Borel sets, we are taking F following phi I, think of phi I as the chart map from that Borel set. So each one, each one, one by one, we have an AI, A1, phi one, and the image of A1 would be this first one, for example. And if it has weight two, then it has weight two. So, so whatever weight it is, you're putting that much weight on it, which just means that you can, you're counting that one with that much more heaviness in the sum. Note that if you have a collection of charts of AI from AI to Z is not unique because you certainly could put this together in a different way possibly. So we say that two um, integer rectifiable currents are equal to each other if when they act on all, any possible collection of tuples, they have the same answers. Okay, so we want to really capture the action of integrating over the, um, the tuples as the defining property of the T's of these integer rectifiable currents. So they can be made with different collections of AIs, different collections of weights, different collections of charts, that as long as the sum comes out to be exactly the same for every possible collection of tuples. Remember the tuple is Lipschitz bounded function F and just Lipschitz functions pi one to pi M defined on the ambient space Z. All right, that's integer rectifiable current, but we still can't handle boundary depth. So remember before we wanted the boundary of T to act on the D of um, acting on omega would be T acting on D omega. So we're going to go for that. And into, go ahead, question? Uh, yeah, um, uh, sorry to ask again. So so, so these um, chart maps, phi i, for example, or the previous slide. So these are um, uh, assumed to be injective or to, so that I get a sub, a sub object of Z on the right hand or, or? They are only Lipschitz right now, although you can actually choose them to be by Lipschitz in a theorem. Okay, so so they are just Lipschitz maps from AI to Z. Okay. Yeah, and then later they prove that there is a way to select a collection of charts where they're by Lipschitz onto their images. Okay, yeah. So you may have seen it defined that way. Mm. Um, but but originally it's just uh, Lipschitz. As long as you can find Lipschitz, the, the, the differential vanishes, so they degenerate. The integral will be zero, so they would not have felt. Yeah, this definition only sees uh, by Lipschitz maps, but because you integrate afterwards, yeah. Right, right. Yes, Christina? I mean basically, yeah. That's the proof. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can say by. The, if you find Lipschitz ones, you could, you've made something that, that 
If you find a collection of Lipschitz maps, phi i, you have the find one. But later you could say, oh, I could have chosen them to be by Lipschitz because you don't see them when you do this. So that's the main idea. So it, as long as you find Lipschitz ones, you have defined a rectifiable current. Then later you could say, oh, wait a minute. I mix my AI is smaller and they'll be by Lipschitz. And uh, change my phi slightly. So that's the main idea. Since they only matters, it's the AIs are not defining it. They're a, if you think of them as like a set of charts, just like a Riemannian manifold has a collection of charts, but other charts can also work. All right, so we still have to get to boundaries now. So to get to boundaries, we, um, an integral current. So now we want integral. This was integer rectifier. May I say something to clarify geometry? So if you forget yeah. about this kind of definition, what happens, you want to just describe inside kind of some manifolds which you can measure. You take those which are image of the Lipschitz map on the general, and this non degenerate scene, you map it back to the Euclidean space. So you just consider Euclidean goes there, it returns back to Euclidean. It must come with a, essentially by Lipschitz map. So this is what you see. So you have, yes. to have two of the world. Both they have received many Lipschitz maps and also have many Lipschitz functions which detect the Lipschitz maps, right? Exactly. So I can do, do it everything functorially. You can forget metric space, only remember these arrows and forget everything else, right? So metric yes, space only point. appears as a kind of screen between two Euclidean spaces, right? All you see, what you throw the light and you see what goes through the screen and you don't see the space otherwise, right? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we're gonna find boundaries. So to, to define a notion of an, of an integral current, we want to add in the idea that the integral current T is both this integer rectifiable current as described above, with this kind of summing. That means you can find such a summing like this. And it's boundary. Now remember how boundary is defined. Boundary of T is acting on a form is equal to T. So let me just write that here because for some reason I didn't write it here. Remember that boundary T acting on a tuple is just equal to T acting on one F pi one to pi M. So this is boundary T is already defined as soon as you have T defined. And then the, the, the part of the definition says integral current, T will be an integral current if this boundary, when you define it this way, also ends up to be integer rectifiable. Now, something to keep in mind is that the original T is defined with a bunch of Weilopschitz charts that are really horrible, and they don't necessarily have nice boundaries. The charts themselves do not necessarily have nice boundaries. And what this is saying is, oh, well, even though the charts don't have nice boundaries, we still can find a boundary overall, and that boundary overall is nice. So we have a T and we have a boundary overall. The individual charts may not have nice boundaries. All right, so now we have this notion of an integral current, integer rectifiable, and its chart also, its boundary also has charts, and the charts for the boundary are completely unrelated to the charts for T. All right, so then we have weak convergence as currents. Tj converts to T infinity if and only if Tj acting on a tuple, any tuple converts to T infinity acting on the tuple. And as before, Tj converging to T infinity goes to boundary Tj converges to boundary T infinity. And Ambrosio Kirchheim define a mass, which I will define later for you, so that the limb m, so the masses are greater than equal to the mass of the T infinity. So these masses are like areas or volumes. They're not quite weighted areas or weighted volumes, but they are somewhat like them. I will describe them later. And the ambrosio kirheim compactness theorem says that if Z is a compact metric space and Tj's are integral currents such that mass Tj is less than equal to V naught, mass of the boundaries is a bounded uniformly less than equal to A naught, and notice Z is compact, then a subsequence Tj going to T infinity in the weak sense. And the T infinity is an integral current itself, which might possibly be the zero integral current. The zero integral current is the one that whenever it acts on a tuple, it is zero back. So that might happen, for example, if these submanifolds are getting smaller and smaller and their mass is converting to zero, then this T infinity will be the zero current. 
Another way that could happen is if two sheets of the TJs are coming together with opposite orientation, then the limit would be uh, the zero current. So you can have opposite orientations coming together causing disappearance. All right, so Federer and Fleming have the same compactness theorem um, for any compact set sitting inside the Euclidean space. And they also define the flat distance. This is a flat symbol of like sharp flat for music, the flat distance between integral currents. And this is actually defined, I should really mention, the first definition of the flat distance is by Whitney. Okay, but they extended Whitney's notion to their, their integral currents here. And they define that two one minus T2 in the flat sense is equal to the infimum of the mass of A plus the mass of B, where A plus boundary B is T1 minus T2. So let me just take this picture here. Here is my T1, say it's a one dimensional curve here. And T2 is this curve. Then A is being used to close it up and make a cycle. So that T1 minus T2 minus A is, is a boundary of a B. And then B is a filling in. And this in Federer Fleming case, this would be a filling in. This is in Euclidean space. So this is Federer Fleming, it's Euclidean, some high dimensional in Euclidean space. And they prove that under the hypothesis of the compactness theorem, that is the setting where the masses of the T's is uniformly bounded and the mass of the boundaries of the T's are uniformly bounded, that weak convergence is equivalent to this flat convergence going to zero. So remember the weak convergence is about testing it on tuples. The nice thing about the flat is that this is actually a distance between two things. And this distance between two things or a norm in their case is going to zero. Then Wenger studied the flat distance, which we will denote as D flat inside Z now, distance between integral currents in a complete metric space Z using this exact same definition except he can't call it a norm anymore because it doesn't come out to be a norm and prove the same results for ambrosio kierheims notion of integral currents. So the main idea is now that we can think of distances between currents instead of just convergence of currents. We have a, a, a distance um, topology now. And um, the idea is it's really about how much um, one dimension higher volume is between the two currents. Also orientation is very important both for this weak convergence because how a, a form is integrated depends completely on orientation. And also this subtraction here is definitely depending very much on the orientation. Okay, so if T, T1 goes this way and T2 goes this way, this B fills it in. Okay. So now we have to come to the question of extrinsic versus intrinsic. All the notions above were defined relative to an extrinsic space, which was Z or it was Euclidean space. And submanifolds MJ converging to limits M infinity based on how the MJ sit inside Z. So in this example here, Z is this box. You can think of it as a box in Euclidean space. And then you have this MJs that are waves like this, a sheet that's going up and down like this. And M infinity could be like a flat sheet. These MJs are converging to M infinity as long as this wave gets skinnier and skinnier so that the two sides of the wave cancel each other. The way these MJs are increasingly narrow wave as viewed inside Z converges currents in Z to the smaller M infinity. They lose a whole lot of mass or area when they suddenly drop to M infinity at the end. This is very much extrinsic information about the way MJ is sitting inside Z and it's not intrinsic. Intrinsically, these MJs are just flat sheets, zero two cross zero one. And the limit M infinity is a zero one cross zero one. Intrinsically, these are not near each other at all. It is only the way that they are sitting inside Z that makes the MJs look like they're converting to M infinity. So everything that we talked about already is extrinsic notions of convergence of submanifolds as how they behave sitting inside an ambient space Z. <clears throat> so then what Wenger and I did was we wanted to define an intrinsic notion, um, an intrinsic flat distance and convergence for a sequence of oriented Riemannian manifolds who are not sitting in an ambient space. 
And what we imitated was Gromov's definition of intrinsic Hausdorff distance. So this is called Gromov Hausdorff distance, but Gromov called it the intrinsic Hausdorff distance in his first. Um, so we imitated that intrinsic flat, intrinsic Hausdorff. And notice we also completely imitated his definition here. So MJs converge in the intrinsic flat sense, if and only if the intrinsic flat distance is gonna to go to zero, where the intrinsic flat distance is an infimum, and we're now imitating Gromov's definition of intrinsic Hausdorff completely. It's an infimum over all complete metric spaces Z, his case, it was compact, but we use complete metric spaces Z and distance preserving maps of the MJs into Z of, in Gromov's case, he took the Hausdorff distance between the two images. And in our case, we take the flat distance between the two images. So infimum over all possible complete Zs and over all distance preserving maps. So what does it mean to be distance preserving? This is the same notion from Gromov. The distance between the images inside Z is equal to the distance inside the original manifold between the two points for every pair of points in the original manifold. So uh, these Christina, have to be Ramanian manifolds. Yeah. Um, are you um, uh, uh, using the embedding infinity space here, uh, Kuratowski embedding? Z. Okay. Over all complete Zs, metric spaces. Okay, so, that's, uh, so this is uh, how we pass from intrinsic to it from extrinsic to intrinsic. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is exactly the same thing that Gromov did for his intrinsic Hausdorff, except here he had Hausdorff distance. Okay, so we're just imitating, but then you say your question about Bonnet spaces, there's a Kuratowski map from the Zs. The images of these two guys will always, will always be sitting inside a um, separable Z. So you could take a subset of Z, that's the image of these two, and that will be a separable Z, and then you can take a Kuratowski map into a Bonnick space. So this could be done in Bonnick spaces, it's equivalent. But we were imitating Gromov's definition exactly. So we wrote it and just taking his exact definition. And the only change we made was that we made it complete Zs instead of compact Zs, because we need complete Zs. So then we wanted to define the more general spaces. So, right, so far it was Riemannian, and now we want to define our general class of spaces, which we call integral current spaces. That's a metric space X key with an integral current structure uh, attached to it. So a Riemannian manifold that's oriented has a, a, a space of points, it has a distance between points, and it has an integral current structure if it's oriented, defined by its charts, the, the standard charts on the manifold. But now we want to take arbitrary metric spaces with an integral current T defined on, well, we need to take the metric completion of the metric space in order to have a complete space. Then we can define an integral current on a complete space. This is using ambrosier kirheims definition. And then we require that the original space X equal the set of T, which is the set of positive density. It's taking every point P inside the metric completion such as limit as R goes to zero of the mass of a ball over RM is greater than zero. This mass is defined using this T. So it's saying the mass of this ball measured with this weight that comes from the T. So we're requiring, and it's, we're sort of attaching this integral current structure onto X in a way such that X is fundamentally related to T. Note that these spaces are rectifiable then because T is an integral current. So T is actually also a rectifiable current, which gives it charts. So T has chart structure and that exact same charts are all going into, uh, initially they go into X bar, but they can be restricted to X such, and, and you can make AI smaller. And T is equal to this sum and the Hausdorff measure of X take away the images will be zero. And so back, Okay, so this is our original, this is how we see that our metric space X is actually rectifiable as long as it's an integral current space. And then we notice that the boundary of X dt is defined, we're gonna define it to be set of the boundary, D and the boundary. So we're using the restricted distance to define our boundaries. That's important. 
We also define the zero space, which is just the empty set with zero being the answer for the distance and zero being the answer for the integral current in every dimension. So every dimension has a zero space. So these are our general spaces that are just lying inside nowhere, right? So they are, XPT is a metric space with a current structure on it. And this will allow us to now talk about distances between these two spaces, even though they don't lie in an ambient space. So we can define the intrinsic flat distance between these guys, metric space, this and this. We're gonna imitate all, the exact same definition we just did. The, the uh, intrinsic flat distance between MJ and M infinity will be the infima. Again, we're gonna take distance preserving maps from the XJs. So this is what involves the DJ, the definition of distance preserving. Any infimum over all Zs and over all complete Zs and all distance preserving maps of the flat distance between the push forwards of the currents. So distance preserving is where we're using the DJ, push forwards of the currents is where we're using the TJs. When it was a Riemannian manifold, the push forwards of the manifolds themselves was essentially the push forward of the current, was creating a pair of submanifolds. Now we just push forward the current structure. So we have a notion of integration. Again, the infimum is over all complete metric spaces. So it does not depend on a specific extrinsic C and over all distance preserving maps. So the spaces are not actually folding inside the Z. If it did fold, let me just zoom in. If one of the XJs looked like it was folding inside Z, then there would be a shortcut inside Z between points. That would not be distance preserving. So it can't really look like this. There isn't this sort of folding effect happening because of the... Uh, distance preserving map requirement. The flat distance DFC is defined using currents in Z. So that's this flat distance here. We already talked about it, but let's just remind you. D flat distance inside Z between these two image things is the infimum of the mass of A plus the mass of B, A plus boundary B equals T1 minus T2. So let's just sort of really take all of this together. So this flat distance I already defined. That's the Whitney Federal Fleming flat distance. We have our first xj. We have our x infinity, and we're studying how close this xj is to x infinity. This guy has a current structure on him. He has a current structure on him. We push them into forward, into a z. We put them in a way that maybe they're really close together. What does it mean to say they're close? What it means to say they're close is that there is some filling b in between them that is small. So a tall, thin bump is not gonna make the distance large. You put them in in a way such that you can fill it in with the least volume possible. You're infimuming over all possible ways of putting them into Z, into all possible Zs. And this is just a reminder what the push forward means. And notice that you can talk about the flat distance between zero and M. That would just mean how well, say, say x infinity is zero. It's talking about how well the M fills itself, zone filling. A plus boundary B is just equal to T1 minus zero. Okay, so all fine. This is well defined to talk about the flat distance between any integral current space and the zero space. That would be talking about how well the integral current space fills itself with an A and B combo. All right, so then we proved that this was a distance, that if the flat distance was zero, if and only if there is actually an isometry from the one to the other, such that the isometry pushes forward the one current structure to the other current structure. If these two are Riemannian manifolds, the flat distance is zero between them, if there's an isometry, which is orientation preserving. So all this captures is that there's orientation preserving when they're Riemannian, but when they're integral current spaces, T can have all sorts of integer weights, remember? So we can have all sorts of integer weights all over them. And so this would push forward the orientation of all the charts and the integer weighting. Then we prove that if MJ flat converges to M infinity, you actually can find a single Z, a single complete metric space, we constructed it. And there are distance preserving maps all into the same Z, such that the flat distance inside this Z space goes to zero. 
in particular, so the boundary of MJ is flat to M, boundary M infinity. This actually forces that they converge weakly. So the boundaries converge and the limit for the masses work. So we can get all of this after we have shown that there's a common Z that could be used for the whole sequence. Ordinarily, each one of these flat distances is an infimum over Z's, and you might say Z depends on J, but we construct a Z that works for the whole sequence. And then Wenger has this beautiful theorem, Wenger's compactness theorem, and it says that if MJ as XJ, DDA, TJs are integral current spaces, which includes Riemannian manifolds that are oriented and finite volume. And you assume that the mass of all the MJs is less than or equal to V naught. So that's the same as saying the volumes is less than or equal to V naught. The mass of the boundaries is less than or equal to A naught. So that's also like the areas of the boundaries. And the diameters is less than or equal to D naught. Then there's a subsequence that converges in the intrinsic flat sense to some m infinity and m infinity is an integral current space, possibly the zero space. So this is extending Federer Fleming's, but notice that we're not requiring that they all sit inside a common compact space. They don't all sit inside anywhere. Each one of them is a separate individual. And we're saying that they converge in the intrinsic sense that we're able to find ZJs, put them into the sequence of ZJs. And this diameter being less than or equal to D sufficed. So that's a very major theorem. So I just, I wasn't sure if this would take my whole time, but I have two more slides below because I never gave you the definition of mass. So since I do have time, I will give you the definition of mass now. Do you have any questions on the previous part before I do that? No questions? Is everybody there? Hello? Yes. You are there, yep. okay. So everyone's fine. I'm gonna get into the definition of mass because so far I just talked about mass and I said it was something like weighted volume, but this property of the limit for the masses being bigger than the mass of M infinity, this property really depends very much on the kind of mass and how it was defined. a question of uh, uh, Morgan in the chat. Did you okay, see great. I can't see the chat, so leave it to me. Uh, why did why diameter bound needed? So this is a chat uh, for everybody. Um, why is the diameter bound needed? Um, if you don't have the diameter bound, there is a result of Wenger and Lang, or first Lang. Uh, where they get a kind of point of convergence. <clears throat> so you might say it's not needed because you could use point of convergence. Point, the point of convergence means you choose points inside the manifold and then the limit will depend on your choice of the points. So the diameter is needed to have a unique limit that doesn't depend on points. That's the best way to say it. I can draw a picture. If, if they are spreading out and say this has a funny behavior over here, then if you, you choose points on this end, the limit is going to be this sort of a thing. But if you choose points on this end, the limit will be this thing. So if you don't have a diameter bound, you can still get these uh, limits, in fact, you will only need the mass of the balls to be controlled and the mass of the boundaries of balls to be controlled. Um, but then you might get different limits depending on your choice of points. So is that a good question, answer? I have also another question I already asked, but I never could get an answer. So what is normalization of mass? So imagine a metric space is just a plane with some non-standard metric. This, you know, yeah. Convex, so just convex body, time. the ball is convex body. How we define normalized volume element? What is the volume of the ball in the one dimensional? Right. Yeah. So, what, normally, what is normalization? Good. So, this time I actually have it all set up for you because I thought you would ask this, so that's why I have it. Because there are so several, think... several natural normalizations. Yeah. So, this is the normalization. So, can so you we're using again, a yeah. Rosie Kierheim, and this is the picture. So, um, what they do is the mass is defined to be this mass measure. 
And the mass measures the minimum bore, this is their definition and then there's a theorem. Their definition of mass of occurrence is equal to the mass measure of the no, charge just look at this a specific example. I don't know currents or whatever. Oh. I just have Banach space and I have a convex set, which is my ball. So what okay. is the volume of this ball? Okay, area so, of this ball with this normalization. For example, if it is square, right. square metric, the, yeah? It will be oh, one okay. or it will be pi or what? So if it's a square, if it's Hilbert space. No, it's not it's, Hilbert space. No, 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 no. Hilbert oh, is, is it's it's a just a soup soup one space, and so it's yes. a, so unit. It's it's a, a square okay, so of, the, take, of, of the size take... two. What okay. is its volume? It's four. It's one. It's pi. What? I think it's going to be two. If it's going to be two over two pi. Two. Well, let, let, me let me draw the picture. Let me draw the picture. Let me let me draw the picture. This is the normalization. Because there are two to the m over omega m of the Hausdorff measure of the ball divided by the Hausdorff measure of the parallel pipette that contains the ball. Wait, wait, Hausdorff measure where? In the Bonnach space, if you're doing a Bonnach space. So, uh, so it will be Hausdorff measure. It's, or normalized or normalized Hausdorff measure. I don't care about the constant, you, how you put the constant. It's but not it's gonna Hausdorff be measure. quite the Hausdorff measure. So it's, if Hausdorff measure, it will be just Hausdorff measure. So it's volume of the ball. So it's not- No, 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 no. You see this ratio here that I'm circling? No, no, but this was the answer. This I just, I, I'm reluctant to go through that. So I, again, I'm considering okay. the situation of this balance okay, space. Okay, let me, let me try to answer. Two-dimensional so balance space. Is, and the heavy unit Bonnet ball. Space. What is the area of the ball? Your mass of this ball. What normalization? Because there are many, many ways you can do it. And I, the and I think they are very different geometrically. They play a completely different role with different problems. When you want to sharpen equality, it's crucial to know the right thing. Right. So you It's going to agree with the Hausdorff measure. Okay. No, no, no. no. Just, just tell me Sorry. whichever. And I accept it. You'll, you'll know. Hausdorff measure, if it's a constant, if a universal constant. It doesn't bother me. It was just Hausdorff measure in the case of a. But it's not just Hausdorff measure. It's not. It's not just Hausdorff measure. But what is this? So take your, you have your Bonnet space. Two dimensional Bonnet space. Inside. There is a unit ball there. Yeah. There's a unit ball. So say, let's yes, pretend like that. One. Yeah. Okay. So there's, that's B1. And now what they want us to do is, so that's the HKB1, right? So. Now we have to take two squared over omega two, which is two dimensional volume of unit ball in two dimensional space. So that's. No, no, but you, you, you just, just part of the piece will disappear. Yeah. Okay, I'm okay, trying that's to better. keep track of watch the definition at the same time. Okay. And then we have to take the soup of the Hausdorff measure of the ball, which doesn't matter because we're gonna divide by a Hausdorff measure, divided by HK of this R, and this R here is a parallel of piped that fits it. So actually in this case, it would agree with it. So R is a parallel of piped. So you take half the measure of parallelepiped around it. Yeah. You take supremum over that. Yes. So, so you, if you, so if it's, it's not parallel, but if, if it's a if it's shaped like this, the unit ball is like this, right? If this is B1, then you have to take the best parallel pipe that fits that. Right. So you divide by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's how the measure divide. It's no, no, I have to okay, digest it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to, thing. yeah, it's hard to digest. Yeah, I agree. That's why my answer is so you take, so you up. take uh, the volume out of measure. So we start with one and divide. And this is this normalization in front is set up so that if it's if it's Euclidean space, then it's one. It's it's gonna just be Hausdorff measure. 
well, normalize with the with yeah. normalization, but by constant, right. because this yeah. gives you a constant. Right. But I understand, of course, in the Euclidean, everything is symmetric. You yeah. cannot have, there's only, right. there is no choices in the Euclidean case. Right. But so then this there, is when there are kind of, for in example. Euclidean, in the Euclidean space, it's a ball, and then the two squared comes from the square. Yeah, but That's you see, for, for example, would it satisfy the co-area co inequality? Yes, it does. I knew you were going to ask that too, so I have a whole page about that. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so it satisfies so, co-area formula as an equality. Yeah, it's an equality if you use this. The, you have this equality for K, for, you have equality for here for k area for area. This, this is, but it has this funny this restrict yeah. No, no, this is hard to believe. No. Okay, I'll... it's very I'll hard to I'll believe. I'll... No, no, if there is, if, if it is actually equality, it must be Euclidean. It's hard to believe. No, no, but it has it on both sides. Wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, there are inequality to that two sided equality is a constant. This, I believe, of course, true. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's It's got the, sorry. Uh, yeah, both sides have this. Um, this mass measure thing. Both of them are using that strange orientation thing. The, this, this, these vertical bar symbols are both, the, that's that mass involved. No, that's remarkable. So you have for this, for this definition, you have co-area equality. I'm pretty sure. And there's a, there's this, 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 this wedge the f part. And yes, in two dimensions, the, time, the case, uh, the, the uh, section wise, how it could be. So suppose df is a. Um, so you just you cannot believe for any form you take of a square, it depends how you exhaust it. Exhaustive parallel to the fights or, or transversely, right? You, you have to have different answers. You can't have the same answer. Huh? Or can you? I mean, it's, it's, very it's because of this part that it's okay. This weird thing is defined by this. No, 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 but just if you look at this example of the square, yeah. you don't need all this. Is, yeah, it's just, it sounds like very naive. Yeah, this is it. All these formulas are just exactly to match, I believe, this kind of example. This is a kind of the worst example, the most deviation from the from the Euclidean. So I'm I'm just saying in practical in practical terms, the co area becomes an inequality because of this strange uh, wedge df that's defined in this way. So it's not exactly that the integral of these slices these um, these slices, which are the slices after you slice it um, for the R level. So you're making the areas, this is for, for each um, R level set. On the right side, you have this wedge DF that, because of the way it's defined actually comes out all right. It's, it's in Ambrosio Kirheim over here. Um, So, so the way they're proving things, everything that they do, everything that they're proving is based on this version of their definition. So the, the version of the, the actual definition doesn't mention this, this Bonnack test that you talked about. The actual definition is that it's the, this mass measure is the minimum Borel measure such that you have this property. And this is what they use to prove everything. And then they have a theorem that says, it turns out, that the mass measure is equal to an integer weight part, this lambda area factor that we just talked about with the parallel pipette coming into play, which depends on, of course, the tangent space at each point, and the Hausdorff measure restricted to the set. This is a theorem. Everything they prove is by describing it in this way, as yeah, the no, smallest course, well, measure. But, 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 but because you have general metric space, but for the one space, this kind of 
suddenly Katie's yeah, the buying space you don't need this part, and then this yeah, it's just a lambda T. Because this is a key kind of problem in that because it's just everything, all deviation from Euclidean is on burning space, right? By the way, the, the yeah, space. yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing is in this. The, the theta, these terms don't matter when it's a For burning example, space. it's unclear with this definition, it's not immediately clear to me why this mass is monotone on the Lipschitz mappings. Right, it's clear from this definition. Uh -huh. Okay, this definition is this beautiful. I, lo I love this definition. Yeah, let me say it's Lipschitz PI. What you're doing is you're saying it's the smallest Borel measure that gives you the formula you would like, which is that T of F pi one to pi M is less than or equal to the Lipschitz pi I's and the integral of F. Because remember, this is like F D pi one wedge D pi M. So you want it to be less than the Lipschitz constants for the pi I's. And okay, let me understand the definition again. So you, yeah. have, you have this mass of this C of these functions. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the minimal but the measure. For every possible F pi ones of I am. Wait, wait, we have the current and you, the, the mass must be a number, not a measure. It has, no, this, so the mass will be the measure of Z where the measure is defined by the minimum Borel measure on Z. The smallest Borel measure on Z, such that for every possible tuple, F pi one to pi M, this ends up less than or equal to the product. Uh, okay, of okay, I, I see, yeah. Yeah, it's a really nice definition. Okay, and well, then they it's, prove it takes time to swallow. Yeah, it's nice, yeah, but I have to understand it, yeah. Yeah. And then this thing. is a theorem, a difficult theorem that they prove. I see, uh huh. And then this follows nicely from this one. So is it this theorem that they have this? Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. No, no, this theorem I understand. Yeah, this limit existence with the limit in the Euclidean space is a little bit effort to prove, yeah. It's more yeah. It's not trivial theorem, we always. Right. Uh, and they use this definition to get all their results. So this definition gives you the mass and it also gives the slicing. Okay. So this is kind of essential part of the whole theory. Yeah, the yes, theory. I would say this is the essential yeah. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the only way to do it, you have to think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to think about it for a while. You have to practice it. On yeah, it, it takes parts. some thinking, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can't figure it out in some, on the spot. No, right, right. It's impossible. To, um, I can send you this photo. <laughs> it helps a little. Yeah. Is this the end of the slicing theorem? Yes. Um, I don't know. Um, is this still uh, your talk or have you already? I think this uh, is a discussion. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I just want to know uh, when to stop the recording. We can put everything. Oh, I think this part of the discussion is worth uh, having recorded. Yes. As long I, nobody's private. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just tell me when you talk, including okay. the discussion. Is over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then this is the slicing theorem, which I see both of these were after my talk because I knew um, that Misha would ask me these questions because he asked me these before. So I added these two at the end. Um, and this slicing theorem then works because of that definition of this. It's it's essentially this definition of these, these are the mass measures, right? So the slicing theorem is in terms of that Borel measure. And this is a Borel measure defined by the slice TFR. And this is the Borel measure defined by T restrict DF, which is a strange thing that has this strange definition of. It's not, this thing is not an integral current because it, it isn't actually integral current. It's like it's it's current, it's structure is, is pointing in the DF direction. Sort of a weird thing. 
and then you iterate the slices. So I think this is enough for what Antoine Song needed. Um, he's using all of this, including the mass and slicing theorem in his work. So I guess I can stop here and you can stop recording.